Hello world, it's Craig. We are winding down the videos on the DigiKey Nibbler and my work-alike project board that I made. In this video, there's some new information I came across that fills in additional details of the Nibbler system. I also have the expansion RAM board and the backplane up and running. Then I wanna go over some design details for version one of this board, like everybody's input on that. And then finally, I'm gonna introduce a ROM board that I'm going to submit on my next board order. Now looking back, one thing that I didn't notice immediately on the Nibbler board is that nowhere on this board is any branding or any DigiKey name or anything that would be tied to DigiKey. It says Rev1 Nibbler1, but that's it. So it's not too surprising after all these years that you know these have become so elusive. Anybody picking up this board with no identifying marks other than the Nibbler would just you know maybe think it was a homemade board and they wouldn't be impressed enough to give it much consideration or unfortunately even keep it for that matter. Now the new information that I have is you know there's a lot of misinformation about the Nibbler out there. And as it turns out, most of it's from me. I was wrong about the backplane not being through. You know, I thought it was point to point. And I have openly been questioning if this product lasted more than a year and if DigiKey ever actually made the add-on boards like that 8K RAM board or the, uh, you know, the analog to digital converter board that was in that one document from Andrew. But once again, I'm proven wrong about some of these things, namely the product lifetime and the ability of the availability of other boards. Came across this listing on eBay for a DigiKey catalog. The listing was from somebody over in Spokane, Washington called Spokanian. The only reason I'm going into this much detail is because I really like this seller. I saw their listing for the catalog and I asked the seller, I said, would you take a look at the catalog and see if it has an entry for the Nibbler? And about an hour or two later, I received a message back with a photo of this Nibbler listing in this catalog. So here we are $20 later with another DigiKey data point. I put a scan of this page on the project page for those that are interested. So remember, the DigiKey only advertised that Nibbler in magazines from June of 78 to June of 79. And this is the May-June of 1982 catalog. So a full three years have passed. Now, finally, they have lowered the price down to $70 but the ROMs are listed for another $15 here. So I'm, I'm really not sure if that $70 included the ROMs or not. The power supply board is still $40, but here's our memory expansion board. It's $60 for 4K, $90 for 8K, and its documentation pamphlet is another $2, which includes a schematic. And that's what we were missing in those documents from Andrew that I talked about in the last video. And they do say it's a brief pamphlet, maybe maybe tempering your expectations after spending two dollars. You know that two dollars, that's seven dollars in today's value. But then I guess I just paid twenty dollars for this catalog that is uh, you know decades out of date. So you know I would gladly pay the seven dollars for that pamphlet if I came across it today. Now they also have this listing for the Nibbler Digital Analog Relay Control Board and the Nibbler analog to digital board. So this is the, another one that we saw in that documentation from Andrew. This digital relay control board, it looks like it's got eight input relays and eight output relays. So rather than go directly into the chip, it has a 24 volt or a five volt uh, relay that you close the relay and then that's detected by the chip. So just another level of isolation on that input. Now, if we look at the top half of this page, we can see that DigiKey had moved on and was pushing a SCMP3 on the INS8073 board, which had Nibble Basic again built into the processor. It's where, you know, on the Nibbler, it's in the EEPROM, in the 73, the INS8073, it's actually coded into the processor if you got that version. And interestingly enough, this says that this is only available from DigiKey, which I find interesting. You know, this again would be exclusive to DigiKey, but I don't think this is actually a DigiKey board but then you know, I'm wrong so much of the time. Now this board has a pair of 2716 sockets and it uses 8255 programmable IO. So by then uh, National had, you know, they've, they had cloned a lot of the Intel chips. And so this is the National INS 8255. 
has INS8154 RAM plus I.O., has a teletype current loop, RS-232 drivers, a cassette interface, were all included on this board, where in the Nibbler they were required, you had to buy that power supply board to get the actual interface things. In 1982, the 2716 was, was very obsolete. The rest of the world was using at least the 2732s, and the 2764s had come out. So this board was already pretty basic, but then the 2716 was also a lot cheaper than the others. Now, interesting, there's no backplane on this. It's got I.O. coming out of both sides of the board. And this was $250 each plus $10 for the manual. The manual is sold separately. Now, I think this is the same board that shows up in National's INS 8073 documentation. At least it looks the same. And in there, we have the description of the board, the schematic, and so forth. So maybe somebody watching has one of these boards, or maybe one will show up someday. But I'm guessing it doesn't say anything about DigiKey on this board either, but hopefully it says something about National Semiconductor. So if you do see a listing for this, at least somebody's picked up this a National Semiconductor board. Okay, so that's the new information that I had. Next up is the Workalike RAM expansion board. Here I have one that's fully populated with 8K, and it's based on that partial documentation we had in the earlier video, the one that Andrew got out of DigiKey some years ago. Now, I never did figure out how DigiKey was doing it with the triple three input NAND, but my design with the quad two input NAND seems to be working okay. Now, there is a silkscreen mistake on this or two, and the edge finger tab is a little bit too narrow. I just used the same footprint that I made for the STD bus, and the STD bus only has you know, 56 fingers or something, so it's much more tolerant of sideways slippage in the socket. So this one is a little bit too narrow, and in the next version I added that uh, a little bit wider. Same thing for the nibbler board itself. This fingerprint tab is, or this, fing this uh, finger tab is just a little bit too narrow, but it's wider on the next version. Now on the RAM board, there's the jumper on board to select power from either the regulated five volts coming in from the finger on the back plane, or from these two regulators, which are fed from the unregulated back plane voltage. And the glue logic follows this RAM bank. So this glue is powered by the same choice on that jumper as, as for this RAM. And I'm thinking about breaking that glue logic off Put the glue logic on the backplane regulated power supply so that only these two guys are selectable by the jumper. And the reason is that this deselect logic doesn't work if you don't have the, the power configured properly on this. And so if I move the logic over to just the regulated 5 volts, then it doesn't care about the power, how you have that configured uh, and the deselect will still work. Because right now, if you have something misconfigured in this board, is not working properly, these guys don't have power, then the deselect doesn't work and the whole nibbler won't work because it won't fetch instructions. So that's just one more thing that can go wrong. So I'm thinking about simplifying that a little bit. But really, you know, there's little justification to use these onboard regulators. They're okay with eight volt input, but by the time you get up to the 10 or 12 volts on the regulated, the unregulated V plus supply, now these regulators, they're just wasting a lot of power. They're getting the board hot. So rather than having two power supplies or using the V plus from the USB adapter, you know, just get a five volt regulator that can power this board and the RAM board. You can plug it into the barrel connector in the back of the back plane and just be done with it. So this board, when I'm running it by itself, I usually use the USB power. When I'm running this as the system, I take this jumper off for the USB power and use my bulk five volt that I have coming into the back plane to power everything. So I have these mounted on here because I wanted to test them, but I don't see that there's any reason to use these. If you do use one of these memory expansion boards, it's an important limitation to keep in mind that Nibble does not properly address memory above 7FFF. And even there, there is a little bug in Nibble. Because I was going through, I was testing this and I was installing the card as different pages and then running a memory test that I wrote using the for next loop. And all the lower blocks were testing okay, but when I ran this as page six and seven, so the highest address was going to be seven FFF. And so I had a, a for next loop ending at seven FFF. The program just blew past seven FFF 
and then it rolled all the way around until the program wind up eating itself and it crashed. And the core problem is that Nibble sees the addresses as signed integers, so 8000 is actually negative 32768. And I haven't actually gone in and dug through the code, but it looks like that for the for next loop, it evidently uses the next address to know when to quit. And when the next address is negative, it's negative number, the loop just going just continues and goes past that in value. And interestingly, if you take it, this up and run it at the next two addresses where everything is negative, then the for next loop works okay and it tests all these negative address values just 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 right. So I haven't tested the backplane much. As I said, I'm using the barrel connector for the five volts. And when using that, remember to take that five volt jumper off of the serial port header. And there is a jumper here to connect the regulated five volts on pin one and two over to those two unregulated inputs on 19 and 21. But of course, then you can't run those through the regulator because you won't have enough voltage left over if that's five volts. But that's there if you just decide to break the five volts up to two different buses on the back plane. So the power LEDs seem to work, the reset button, Works okay, but I don't know if there's mistakes in any of the silk screen out here on the bus test points, other than that one mistake built into the DigiKey documentation where the polarity of the sense B inputs on two pins are flipped. So I will make a change or two to the back plane uh, after I get feedback from, or give an opportunity to get feedback from anybody else that's built in this back plane. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one thing this system needs is some ROM, a way to store programs in ROM. So I took the 8K RAM design and I swapped out all of the RAM for a pair of 2732 EEPROMs in ZIF sockets to make an 8K ROM board. So the two ROMs on this are page zero, and the RAM on this is page one. Then the new EEPROM board can be pages two and three, and page two is the target page for the ROM board because after a reset, if Nibble finds a program at the beginning of page two, it'll automatically execute that program. So I plan on running this RAM as pages six and seven, the ROM board as two and three, and then that'll leave two pages in between where I can put either another RAM board or another ROM board. And the system has, you know, really no IO to speak of other than the three flag lines and the two sense lines, and one of each of those are being used for the serial port. So maybe, you know, somebody else or future me will make an IO board someday. But until then, you know, just with this RAM and the ROM, this is going to be a nice usable system. And finally, I made some corrections for the next version of this board. So as I said, on this first version, I used the leftover footprint from my STD bus projects. Tab was a bit narrow, so I fixed that. I think I'm now at the slot width minus about 12 thousandths. I fixed that resistor silk screen, and then I added some other useful signal names and configuration hints here and there. I swapped the TTL adapter transmit and receive signals up here that were backwards, and also the pin six and pin 10, which were backwards in that DigiKey table. But these pins switched down here, it's really of little consequence because I also made some fairly significant changes to this jumper system. In this version of the board, it's too easy to set up a contention between the serial port and this inverter output. So this signal is now configured in three steps, which allows any mix and match between the inputs to the board, the inputs to the processor, meaning from the TTL receive data, the edge connector, and those signals going through the inverters. And if this combination of jumpers doesn't suit your needs, you can still wire wrap between any jumpers to get any kind of configuration that you would like. Now you'll notice that this little jumper, which is for the deselect, I've got a little resistor on that now, and that's because this blasted deselect has fooled me more than once when I took out the memory board to do something with it, then came back and the system wouldn't work at all because I had taken out the board that was controlling the deselect. So I looked at that and, you know, that signal is, it needs to be pulled down for this board to work. And to, to do that, to get a reliable zero on that pull down, it's gonna need to be a resistor below 3K or so. But on this board, I did run that signal through the 81LS97 buffer, so it's certainly capable of delivering the half a milliamp or so that it takes to pull this line up and overpower this 3K resistor that's on the pull down. So on the next version, I'm debating if I should make an optional resistor to ground rather than just this jumper. And I really wish they had made that open collector so we could have just used a pull 
up on this board rather than a pull down. All right, well, that's the status of all of these. I have the ROM board made. I'm just not quite sure when I'm going to send off my next board order. Now, the last order of business I wanted to point out is that this can wind up being a pricey project. If you didn't get one of those $5 INS 8060s from Elliott Supply that I mentioned in an earlier video, it seems that street price on the INS 8060 is in the $30 to $50 range. Now, on the bright side, even with a $50 processor and adding another $30 or $40 in RAM and these... 81LS97 glue logic buffers, the board still will probably cost less than the $150 that the original nibbler cost. But as an alternative to building this hardware, you may just want to be a SCAMP programmer. And another route is one of the PIC processor emulator boards. So on the SCAMP project page, I've added a page for other people's emulator boards and other people's hardware boards that actually use SCAMP processors. Now, these are just the ones that I know about and that I got from the, the UK Vintage Computer Forum. But there's links on those to the creator's site. And if there's build files or there, at least there's enough information that you can contact the designer of those boards and get, get build files. But if you know of something else, go ahead and send it to me. But it should at least get you started. So that's it for this video. Hopefully you found the videos on this Nibbler system interesting. And remember this channel is not monetized. It's entirely fueled by likes, shares, viewer interaction, and subscribers. Thanks for watching. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.